Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. In this knowledge series, today we are going to take up a very very important topic and this is from the perspective of environment and ecology. Now, first to give you a brief introduction of what we are going to do here and then after that we'll commence with the chapter. So, first and foremost you know that if it comes to environment and ecology, this has been one area from where a lot of questions have been asked off late. And by off late, I mean last six to seven years or even more than that. So now we have seen that this has become a very crucial area from where regularly questions are being asked. If I give you the breakup of both your prelims and mains examination, in the prelims examination, you will see that there are at least 15 questions, if not more, coming every year. If you look at the past papers, you'll see that at least 15 questions and sometimes going up to 20. There have been some exceptional areas as well, some exceptional years as well. For example, 2013 and 14. If you look at the question paper, you'll see that more than 30 questions have come from environment and ecology. So, so crucial this subject has been especially for the prelims examination. Even if you go to the mains examination, you'll see that in the GS paper 3, in the GS paper 3, there are at least 3 to 4 questions being asked from environment and ecology. And from that perspective also, when we look at how the questions are being asked, <coughs> you'll understand that many of these questions have been coming from some of the areas where a lot of programs and policies are being undertaken by the government or these are the questions which are being asked from issues which pertain to the environment. So that's why we are expecting at least three to four questions there as well, meaning that up to 50 marks of question uh, worth of questions can be asked from this particular section in your mains examination now when it comes to now when it comes to even your gs paper 1 where geography questions are being asked you will see that in the mains examination even there there are some of the areas which are somewhat related to the environment and every year if you just go back and look into the previous papers let's say 2020 mains or 2021 mains you'll see that there are one or two questions in even gs paper 1 which have been asked from the perspective of environmental geography so that's why this is one area which has become immensely important from the perspective of your examination. So that's why in the knowledge series, we are also going to take some of the key areas from where very regularly the questions have been coming. And in that very sense, the first topic that we are going to take in today's lecture is biosphere reserves. Now, when it comes to biosphere reserves, first and foremost, <coughs> we'll have to understand what do we mean by biosphere reserves. But just even if you look at the definition, definition is something that is a very uh, in, in very formal words, but I'll just break it down for you and tell you what exactly we mean by what it has been written here. Areas of terrestrial and coastal or marine ecosystems or a combination thereof which are internationally recognized within the framework of UNESCO's program on man and the biosphere. Now, first and foremost, what do we mean here and what are we doing? Let's try to understand and break down what the definition itself says. Now, biosphere reserves. So, first and foremost, if I simply ask you what is the meaning of a biosphere, you might have come across some of the key areas from environment and ecology if you have uh, done this chapter. If not, just understand what we mean by biosphere. Biosphere is, you can say, an integration of all the kinds of living forms. All right, all the kinds of living forms that we have and all these living forms, they can be uh, seen together in one area. So you may have an area where you have, let's say you have an area where you have areas of land, you have water bodies here as well. So you can say this is an integration of land, water and air where any organism or let's say a bunch of organisms can survive. So that will be called as a biosphere. I'm just trying to put things simply. Now, when we say biosphere reserves, what we are trying to do as a part of biosphere reserves is to understand an area where we may have a lot of species together. We may have 
let's say human settlement also in the adjoining areas and we want both to grow together we want both of them to grow together we want both of them to survive together and avoid as much as possible avoid the conflict that can happen between humans and the wild so that's why this these are the kinds of areas which are being demarcated by the governments of various countries and that's why we are looking at biosphere reserves and trying to understand what their importance is and how exactly can we take all the measures which which are required for their conservation so that's why they can be terrestrial ecosystems they can be coastal or marine ecosystems as well where we are looking at international collaborations and we are trying to recognize the areas where these can be made to survive properly without having any interference whatsoever or even if there is we know how to use them or maybe let them survive sustainably so sustainability has been sustainability has been a very major you can say keyword when it comes to biosphere reserves and that's why you will see that there are various areas or various zones which are marked when it comes to biosphere reserves and accordingly all the steps are taken so so first and foremost what we understand by what biosphere reserves is it's very simple we are saying that these are areas where it can be in any ecosystem terrestrial or aquatic where we are trying to conserve the species conserve what kind of species both plant and animal species where they might also live together with the humans but we are making sure that neither of the one are getting hampered by the action of the other so this is what basically we are trying to do and most importantly remember this and basically this may be important from prelims perspective where we are looking at program on man and the biosphere and uh, under this program for the first time we had thought of this particular concept of biosphere reserve so let's try to understand what are the criteria under which we can demarcate certain areas as biosphere reserves so first and foremost we are talking about areas which are effectively protected and minimally disturbed and these are core areas of value of nature conservation so that's why we are trying to understand what are these areas where perhaps we have larger amount of species diversity we may have a lot of genetic diversity and we want to conserve these areas so that's why these areas first will be demarcated and these areas will be marked for conservation so that's why we are saying that effectively protected and minimally disturbed areas or core areas then after that when we are talking about these core areas they should be typically of a biogeographical unit and large enough to sustain viable populations representing all the trophic levels in the ecosystem meaning that if we are looking at any area where we want to declare them as biosphere reserves first and foremost we should see how many or what kind of species do we have do we have let's say a, a monoculture kind of a situation or do we have a lot of uh, species that may come together or may survive together or let's say they are dependent on one another for their survival so that's why we have to get these areas into account and once we have marked these areas then perhaps they can be seen as a part of biosphere reserves then after that there should be a management authority to make sure that there is an involvement of the local population as well many of these areas especially you will see whether in india or many of the other areas of the world where biosphere reserves have been marked you will see that these are also areas where typically people have been looking uh, living for centuries many of the tribal populations have been living here for centuries and they have been interacting with the wild they have been surviving with the wild and they know how to survive with them they know how to coexist so rather than survival which is a word which i have been using i should use the word coexist that many of these people many of these tribes they have coexisted with all the species of flora and fauna and they know how to survive along with them they know how to exist along with them and they know how to use them for the betterment of uh, the tribal population as the at the same time they have been doing that sustainably without even knowing that word that has become probably you can say a very important word in today's world so 
this is the third criteria that there should be management authority to make sure that there is a co cooperation from the local population as well that people from the local population people who are living in these areas they should also be involved in these uh, areas then after that finally the pre preservation of traditional tribal or rural modes of living harmonious and harmonious use of uh, for the harmonious use of the environment so this is also very very important and you will see that there are a lot of steps that have been taken in this regard and it's not only something which is related to the biosphere reserves but you will also see that there are many steps that have been taken by the government over the years where we have been trying to make sure that the tribal way of living does not get destroyed or it's not that in the name of development or in the name of progress we are just destroying the old ways old habits and we are simply trying to run over them so this is also something that the governments over the years have been trying that they should not be losing out on all these traditional practices and many of these traditional practices also have been now you will see that they have been recognized as traditional knowledge and as a part of the IPR regime or the IPR policy of India we have seen that all these kind of things also are being preserved now because in the past we have seen that there have been multiple controversies that have happened where one company or the other coming from somewhere a private entity may be coming from the western world they have actually tried to get hold of this knowledge and they have get try to get patents over it so all these kind of issues have also existed over the past so that's why you'll see that uh, the governments have also been trying to take into account all these things and all the traditional habits the traditional ways of living also have to be conserved along with all these areas so that's why it is not simply an area of conservation where we are trying to just close down the area and make sure that the conservation happens yes there is a part of the biosphere reserves where that will happen but apart from that biosphere reserves in total will also have areas where all these things can also ta be taken care of moving on if we just simply look at what are the functions of biosphere reserves you will see that there are three important areas of uh, importance for us one is conservation of biodiversity and cultural diversity second is economic development that is socio-culturally and environmentally sustainable very very important point i would say and then the logistics support so that the development through research monitoring education and training can be given so that's why these are the three important functions and in the biosphere reserves that's why we mark different areas in any biosphere reserve we mark all these areas so that all the efforts that we need the efforts can be taken according to the requirements these efforts can be taken in a manner that they help in one way or the other so that's why conservation yes any kind of protected area and we'll also discuss about what protected areas are later so any kind of protected areas just remember that the core value of any protected area would be what we want to conserve the biodiversity we want to conserve the flora and fauna the species that live there so that of course will be one of the major functions of any uh, biosphere reserve but at the same time there are other areas of interest as well for example we also want the development to happen for the people who are living in all these areas so that's why people who are living in these areas they should also have the means in the manner that they also develop sustainably without hampering anything else without hampering the flora and fauna of the given areas so that's why in uh, in this situation we see that uh, we look at development which is socio-culturally and environmentally sustainable and then finally we are looking at logistic support so that we can make sure that all the research activities and education training and monitoring can also take place along with this uh, the conservation activities and the development activities because you also get to learn a lot you also get to learn a lot about these areas about the conservation practices a lot uh, about what kind of benefits we can derive out of these flora and fauna and all for all these a lot of research and a lot of education is also required people also need to be educated people also have to be made aware of the situation made aware of why conservation is so important and such a core topic to understand for each and every citizen of the country so that's why all these are the functions which can be seen as a part of the biosphere reserves now 
first and foremost let's try to understand how do we demarcate the areas in a biosphere reserve generally you will see that biosphere reserves are very large areas compared to others uh, other kind of protected areas generally you will see that biosphere reserves are perhaps the largest of all these areas now in all these areas which are marked as biosphere reserves there are three categories or three zones into which they can be divided so let's try to understand what are these three zones so if you see here there are three zones that you can see on your board uh, there is the green part there in part there is the navy blue part and then there is the light blue part correct so these three parts if you see these three parts these three parts are called as core zone buffer zone and transition zone all right so this part the innermost part this is called as the core zone this part is called as the buffer zone and this part is called as the transition zone all right now core zone is the area where we want to make sure that very strictly all the conservation activities are uh, being taken and that's why there will be no activities or in general the activities will not be allowed here so if you look at the the activities the various kinds of activities that we have you will see that for example human settlement can be allowed where human settlement can be allowed in the transition zone or maybe towards the border of the buffer zone or between the borders of the buffer and the transition zone but mainly in the transition zone human settlement is allowed but in the core you will see that in the core the a core zone human settlement is not allowed these are areas of you can say strict conservation where that's why areas only something which is uh, allowed is research activities only research activities with permission will be allowed otherwise nothing else will be allowed in this core area in the buffer area what else is allowed in the buffer area you will see that education and training is also allowed tourism activities are also allowed in the buffer area and then finally in the transition area transition area you can say is almost the outermost part of the biosphere reserve and that's why here all the activities you can say more or less are required but again uh, these are areas because since they come under the purview of biosphere reserves so that's why in because they are a part of biosphere reserves here also the activities are limited the settlements and the development activities allowed are also limited but because we are almost at the boundary or the finish line of the biosphere reserves that's why the amount of activities which are allowed here are much larger or much higher in number as compared to what's allowed in the buffer zone or in the core zone all right so that's why if you look at the core areas or the core zone you'll see that this is an area of strictly protected zone that contributes to the conservation of landscapes ecosystem species and genetic variation so that's why this is an area where only research activities are allowed and apart from research activities nothing else is allowed in this particular area and then after that once we come out of the core zone now just remember that here what we have depicted is that there is only one single core zone but in many of the cases you will see that uh, th these core zones can be multiple for example you may have an area let's say if this is a biosphere reserve then there are possibilities that you may have a couple of core zones like this and then there might be buffer zones also around them and then there might be the transition zones so that's why these it's not that uh, it's only one particular area which can be defined as a core zone there can be multiple core zones as well within a biosphere reserve so so we have the core zone and then surrounding the core zone we have the buffer zone so of course it provides the buffer area between the outermost boundary of the biosphere reserve and the innermost part where all the core activities of conservation are taken so that's why as i said that in the core area only research activities are allowed nothing else is allowed in the core active uh, in the core areas and in the buffer zone or the buffer area here educational uh, uh, educational um, things are also uh, allowed uh, training is also allowed research activities also allowed human settlement also towards the transition boundary human settlements are also around to, uh, tourism is also allowed so all these kind of activities can happen in the buffer zone and then finally we have the transition zone where we see that all the activities all are, are allowed but 
in a manner that is sustainable, socio-culturally sustainable and environmentally sustainable. So that's why these are, this is how we define the different areas of the uh, biosphere reserve. Now if you just go into the brief history of how the concept of biosphere reserve itself came into the picture and this is something that uh, comes into the core of uh, the environmental protection or many of you can say the environmental activities uh, that had started in the 1960s. In the 1960s and the 70s you can say that all of a sudden the world started to realize the importance of environmental conservation and you will see that there were a lot of uh, uh, ways in which people started to raise their voices for environmental conservation. In the 1960s and 70s you will see that there have been a, a lot of protests, there have been a lot of activities and the world not only people in general but the leadership also started to recognize the importance of conservation because until then you might say that in a manner we were going for rampant developmental activities a lot of destruction of the flora and fauna and the ecosystems have happened all across the world and it's not that it did not continue afterwards but you can say that at least the first ray of hope started in the late 1960s and early 1970s there so a, a book also was written and after that we saw that all of a sudden people also started to realize that we are moving into a zone which can become very difficult for us to handle uh, at a later stage if steps are not taken seriously now. And in this regard you will see that a lot of environmental conferences etc started to happen in uh, in the early 1970s. So 1974 we see that. Uh, the concept of biosphere reserves was introduced by a task force of man and biosphere program. So man and biosphere program is something that had uh, as a concept in the 1960s was being discussed and in 1971 this program uh, was launched and 1974 we saw that uh, this man and biosphere program was launched and uh, sorry uh, biosphere reserves uh, concept was given as a part of the task force of man and biosphere program. Then after that we saw that the biosphere reserves network all across the world was launched in 1976. So in 1976 this happened, then 1983 we saw that first international biosphere reserve congress was conducted and we saw that now there were activities and also follow ups that were happening to what was being done and what kind of activities and what kind of developments and what new things are happening in these biosphere reserves, what are the conservation programs that are being taken, a review started to happen for all these conservation programs and every 10 years since then you will see that these kind of reviews have been happening. And 1984 we saw that action plan for biosphere reserves were also taken and then as a part of the action, uh, action plan a lot of conservation activities were taken and all the conservation activities as a part of UNESCO's program was also given to and also you can say uh, given to all the countries which were a participant of this network and all these countries also started to ensure that they are also following everything accordingly. And India also yes India also became a part of the program became a part of the action plan and India also I mean it's just uh, before this only we saw that all these activities had started in India. We saw that we had our Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and as a part of the Wildlife Protection Act we saw that a lot of activities, conservation activities and the programs were launched by the government of India. So that's why India also started to grow along with the world, started to recognize the importance of environmental conservation and we saw that a lot of these activities happened in India also. So what we are talking about is the man and the biosphere program which was the most important program, the key important program bef uh, uh, behind the biosphere reserves that were categorized all across the world. So what basically it aims to do is to establish a scientific basis for enhancing the relationship between people and their environment. So that's why it combines the natural and social sciences which have view with a view to improving human livelihoods and safeguarding natural and managed ecosystems. So that is what basically we are talking about a coexistence, correct? This is ultimately what we are trying to do that we are coexisting along with the wild. 
we know how to allow, uh, coexist with them we know how to avoid the conflicts the governments also have been trying you might see that there have been a lot of activities in this regard a lot of educational programs in this regard as well by the government of india and with all that we have seen that people have also become more accepting of all the wild that they have been living with and people also have understood how to coexist with them people have understood how to make sure that they can live their own lives without hampering the lives of the wild and so that the wild can also exist in their own while the people in all these areas they also know how to exist on their own so if you look at the biosphere reserves and again this is a factual part where you will see that all these are the biosphere reserves in india which are a part of the man and biosphere program of unesco so you may just uh, i mean if you just want to look at the names you may just pause here for let's say 30 seconds and you can look at all this this is something which is directly important maybe for your prelims examination for example what they can do is that they can give you uh, a couple of these uh, biosphere reserves and they can ask you which of the following have been a part of man and biosphere program so that's where these kind of questions can actually come in the exam so that's why you have to be aware of some of the ones especially the ones which are recent additions all right the ones which have been recent additions they are going to be more important for your examination so please make sure that you do that and you and uh, you just look at all this list now what we are talking about basically are protected areas so as a part of the protected areas when we say that something is a protected area you will see that there are all these categories which can be seen as a part of the protected areas network so as a part of the protected areas network which has been identified by iucn we see that all these are the categories under which various kinds of activities can be taken or various kinds of uh, uh, conservation activities can be taken by various governments of the world so that's why strict we have strict nature reserves wilderness areas national park natural monument or feature we have habitat or species management area we have protected landscape or seascape and protected areas with sustainable use of natural resource so as a part of if you look at this kind of categorization the biosphere reserves basically come under the fifth category all right biosphere reserves will come under the fifth category here so they become a part of category 5 of this uh, iucn categorization so protected areas when we say protected areas we are basically talking about the areas which can become a part of the protection activities the conservation activities whether ecological conservation or even cultural protection so all these kind of activities whether for the tribes which have been living there for a very long time or the flora and fauna which have been existing here so there are multiple ways in which protected areas can be defined and as a part of all these definitions of protected areas we see that the category 5 is where the biosphere reserves lie so if you look at the list of biosphere reserves and now we are entering the last part a very small part although but a part which is factual in nature a part which is factual in nature but but this is one part which has been specially important for your examination from where we have seen that a lot of questions have been coming in the past so first and foremost these are all the uh, biosphere reserves all the biosphere reserves that we have in the country today and all these biosphere reserves for one reason or the other for all the flora and fauna that they have for all the natural habitat that they have that they sustain for that they have been demarcated so if you look at all this list there are some of these biosphere reserves which are more important as compared to others so we also need to understand what they are uh, which kind of which biosphere reserves they are so let's have a quick look at all these biosphere reserves in the in the, in the country which are more important for you perhaps from the examination perspective the first one is nilgiri biosphere reserve now nilgiri biosphere reserve if you look at some of the key areas and now uh, what you will see on your screens for the next let's say 3 4 minutes all these areas perhaps factually are also important for you 
so pause it read it also because these are factual areas nothing for me to uh, explain as such but for you it is very very important so that's why first and foremost when we talk about the nilgiri biosphere reserve where exactly do we have nilgiris between the trijunction of kerala tamil nadu and karnataka so now in these areas when we look at the location what we know, know is that it has been recognized under the man and biosphere program there are national parks for example we have the silent valley national park and the bandipur national park here so these two have been a part of nilgiri biosphere reserve then at the same time we see that there are these endemic species of flora and fauna which are existing in this Uh, nilgiri biosphere reserve now just understand that when we are looking at all these biosphere reserves they will be important from the perspective of examination especially if they have been in any kind of discussion if they have been in the news then in that case the chances of they coming in the examination becomes even more permanent then we have sundarbans sundarbans are a very unique ecosystem very unique you can say uh, biosphere reserve and also remember that these are the largest single mangroves in the world all right single stretch of mangroves in the world uh, it is shared between west bengal in india and bangladesh a large part of sundarbans are uh, at in bangladesh and a, a big chunk is also in india in west bengal area so that's why when we talk about the areas most importantly we have it in the west bengal area now remember that it is also a national park a tiger reserve and a biosphere reserve at the same time also because of its unique flora and fauna there are two important uh, flora and fauna that you have here you have the sundari trees which are found here which are a kind of the mangroves that we have in this area and at the same time we also have the royal bengal tiger which are found in the mangroves of the sundarbans so for them sundarbans are very well known and that's why again the endemic flora and fauna they will be very very important also there are a lot of um, uh, in, uh, endemic types or uh, tribes also which are found in these areas so just the names of these tribes also will be important for you then we have manas now manas is also important from the perspective that at the same time what we see for manas is that it is also an elephant reserve at the same time it is also a biosphere reserve also it is a unesco world heritage site also it is a tiger reserve so that's why world heritage site tiger reserve elephant reserve and biosphere reserve so that's why these are some things which are unique for them and that's why there are chances that the questions can come from here so that's why all the information that we have given here this information factually can be important for you then we have norkek now in case of uh, norkek what we see is that there are two importances that we have for norkek one that the red panda is found here and also the oranges that are found in norkek they are very very famous and they are also called as mother of all the oranges so that's why these are uh, for them norkek is very very important found in the meghalayas so mother of all the Uh, oranges that uh, orange is found here at the same time we know that uh, the red panda uh, is also found here so that's why this becomes very very important then we have gulf of mannar now gulf of mannar you might know that we have a part a stretch which is between india and sri lanka so that becomes uh, gulf of mannar and here also we have some of the endemic flora and fauna which can be very very important so one of the richest coastal regions of asia is gulf of mannar then we have agastya milai now here what we see is again shared between two states that is kerala and tamil nadu here we see that lion tailed macaque is found here which is very very important and that's why this is one area which becomes very well conserved we also see that there are plantations also which are found in all these areas and the surrounding areas which are also very crucial then finally uh, we have run off kutch which is again a very unique uh, wildlife uh, a very unique stretch and that's why this also has been uh, marked as a biosphere reserve so that's why large, this is the largest biosphere reserve in india when we look at the animal species which are found some of these animal species they are uh, 
very very important from the perspective of conservation because this is a very unique area and this area is not found in any other part of the country then we have the nanda devi and nanda devi is known for something called as valley of flowers and that's why uh, there are some uh, that's why this also has been recognized as a world heritage site by unesco so that's why this is again a national park as well as at the same time also a biosphere reserve so uh, from the perspective of uh, the conservation it has something which is very unique so valley of flowers national park is also found in this particular area which is a very unique uh, endowment and we see that a lot of tourism activities also happen here then we have the kanjanjanga and in kanjanjanga what we see is that here it is best known for the kanjanjanga peak found uh, where exactly is it located it is located in the state of sikkim and here again this is one of the himalayan ecosystems where biosphere reserve has been formed then we have the cold desert again recognized as biosphere reserve now cold desert area this is you can say the eastern part of the himalayas in the himachal pradesh area now in this when we look at uh, this area this is a cold desert meaning that scarcity of water is here and at the same time uh, the temperatures are very very low the temperatures can be as low as minus 20 minus 30 degrees celsius in the winters now these are areas specially known for snow leopards these are areas which are specially known for snow leopards and that's why this is one area which is very unique because snow leopards are uh, rarely found in one or two of the other areas but mostly the conservation activities with regards to the snow leopards have been taken up in this particular area in here and there is one national park which is the pin valley national park which is located in this cold desert area then after that finally we have the panna biosphere reserve now panna biosphere reserve i also want to read uh, want you to read uh, on it from the perspective of your mains examination as well because there have been a lot of activities that have happened in the kane betwa region and we have seen that panna biosphere reserve or the tiger reserve that we have there that also has been a uh, very very important uh, importantly in the news because a lot of activities have been happening and the conservation activities along with these activities have not been happening very well and that's why uh, we have seen that a lot of environmentalists have raised their voices against these kind of activities which have happened in this area so that's why from that perspective this is something which is very very important so that's why this last part that we have seen this is something which is very important crucially from your uh, perspective of your prelims examination but whenever the these kind of conflicts or wherever these kind of controversies have been happening there are chances that they can also appear in your mains examination now to end the session the last part just look at one of the ways in which questions can be asked which among the following could be considered as protected areas in india national parks wildlife sanctuaries biosphere reserves reserved and protected forests conservation forest and community reserves and private protected areas now when it comes to protected areas in the country when it comes to india we see that all these areas which i have listed down here all these can be considered as protected areas even the private protected areas are also considered as protected areas so that's why the correct answer here for us would be all of the above that all these are considered as protected areas in the country so it's not only biosphere reserves or wildlife sanctuaries or national park all these are also considered as a part of the protected areas so with this this is the end of the session so what we have understood is a basic of what biosphere reserves are and all the biosphere reserves which are found in india the factual part of it they become important from the prelims perspective and the basic understanding of the criteria the functions etc they can also be important from the mains perspective now this is where we'll end the session you uh, uh, you have some of the questions that you have asked I'll answer all these questions that you had asked and then after that we'll end the session for the day. Alright, so there is the first question by Ravi. How do we actually distinguish among national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, biosphere reserves and community reserves? Sometimes we call the same place as a bios uh, wildlife sanctuary as well as a Ramsar site. So yes, uh, so what happens is basically when you look at the areas, uh, 
the IUCN category that we categorization that we saw in that categorization all these different areas are marked so for example let's say when it comes to the biosphere reserves it comes as a part of category 5 national parks come as a part of category 2 wildlife sanctuaries as a part of category 4 Ramsar sites are completely different and incidentally tomorrow's session that we have is completely based on Ramsar sites and yes there are national parks or wildlife sanctuaries that can be declared as wildlife uh, declared as Ramsar sites biosphere reserves in general are the largest of all these biosphere reserves may uh, contain some of the wildlife sanctuaries and may contain some of the national parks so national parks and wildlife sanctuaries are the core protected areas and biosphere reserves are much larger than that what is the difference between uh, biodiversity and biosphere completely different concepts uh, biodiversity is uh, something which where we are looking at diversity of the species whether uh, according to the species or their genes or the genetic variability etc but when it comes to biosphere biosphere is one area we are talking about an area where land water air everything is present and that's why the species can survive very well there so that's why uh, wherever you have biosphere the biodiversity will be higher in these areas Biosphere reserve area is declared by the center or the state authorities. The center will take the decision and it can be included as a part of the uh, activities or it can be included as a part of uh, the UNESCO's man and biosphere program if it is recognized by them. All right. So these as I saw that these were some of the key questions that uh, you had asked. So with this we will end the session. Please go through the session again the areas which are factual I would un I would ask you to just go through that information specifically from prelims perspective and all the conservation activities and the topics related to them can be important for your mains perspective. So with this we come to the end of the session for today. I hope that this session helps you in understanding this concept very well. We will be back again with another session. This will be on Ramsar sites and this is where we will discuss about it in tomorrow's session. So with this we come to the end. Thank you very much for joining the session. Goodbye.